climate globally is changing due to the influence of human activity. That is now well established. But who is doing what about it? More specifically, who is responding to current and potential future impacts of climate change in Southern Africa? People from government, civil society, business, research institutes and universities gathered in Cape Town in late 2013 to discuss exactly that. While mitigation or the reduction of greenhouse gases is critical to minimising the extent of human-induced climate change, the conversation here was targeted at climate adaptation, reducing the extent of negative impact on people and the environment. Climate adaptation is a priority across much of Africa. So what is the adaptive challenge that we're facing? Well, it's about understanding change. What changes are we seeing in the climate and the environment more broadly? What changes can we expect in the future? And what influence will this have on society in terms of laws and policies? Our business practices, consumption patterns, where we live and how we live. The adaptive challenge is about making choices with this new information. To proactively change society and our relationship with the climate in positive ways. <laughs> Many of these choices are contentious and bring to the surface important differences in what people value and believe to be important. They challenge the status quo, the continuation of business as usual, making many people anxious. These are choices about infrastructure investments, land uses, economic and technological developments and social services. Choices that once made will be with us for a long time to come and shape the features of our society. The adaptive challenge is about investing in the future. It's about recognising the complex connections, knock-on effects and feedbacks between our activities, the life systems we rely on and the things that we value. I think it's a lot to do with how it is that people approach the notion of adaptation, understanding that it's about making a transition, and understanding that it's not about um, you know being defensive or reactive, but thinking ahead and thinking in terms of how can we head off some of these um, coming risks and how it is that we can address some of the existing challenges we had anyway. Not enough policymakers see the opportunity that climate change could bring. They only see the threat. They see the threat on the economy, they see the threat of losing jobs and you know, not being able to use coal anymore, and they see that as a threat. Well, actually, it could be an opportunity. How can we as South Africa develop sustainably, develop into an economy that is innovative, um, that is a leader in renewable energy, for example, that provides and, and and stimulates growth and jobs and addresses inequality and poverty by doing things differently. Adaptive challenges are different in that they can only be addressed through changes in people's assumptions, beliefs and worldviews and through changes in priorities, habits and loyalties. They involve shedding some entrenched ways of thinking and being in the world, tolerating disequilibria and losses and also generating the capacity, capacities that we need to collectively thrive. So adaptive challenges are not like technical problems in that there's no clear linear path to follow when resolving adaptive challenges. We have this great uncertainty, which I would say is definitely a social uncertainty in, whether, in what our politicians and our, well, our, our whole society, including us, is going to do. We're actually talking about decisions that people make today, not um, problems and decisions that might be somewhere out in 2070 or 2100. Talking about impacts, we tend to talk about them in 2030 or in 2070. And it, and it gives us, even though, it's, even though you have to know them again, 
um, it gives people a sense that everything's off there in the, in, the, in the far distant future. So I think it's actually far better to start from asking people what are the sorts of decisions that you face today and which ones of those are going to run into climate change. What are people in the southern African region doing to face this adaptive challenge? There's a wide spectrum of activity developing within the research community, in government, civil society and within business. And some particularly interesting things are happening where there's a collaboration between these sectors. Within the research community, considerable effort is going into measuring, projecting and visualising temperature and rainfall patterns, working out the relationships between different climate factors, impacts and cost implications, and looking at what barriers exist to adopting climate adaptation measures. But there's also a recognition that physical climate science cannot provide all the answers and adaptation responses will have to address a range of possibilities. So what adaptation scientists really want to know is how hot is it going to get and how dry or how wet is it going to get. And climate scientists are trying to provide that information. Um, there's been a lot of work on this over the last 20 to 25 years, but still we're unable to provide the kind of precise information that adaptation scientists want, despite improvements in understanding. We're trying to improve the visualisations, which is really the, the bread and butter of climate science in how we communicate it, so graphical uh, visualisations and maps. Um, how, how do we use those? How, do they, how are they interpreted? Um, and really we have a very small evidence base about how that's actually used in practice. So the long-term adaptation scenarios process in South Africa is an attempt to get the country to think about how to integrate adaptation responses with development. So not to see adaptation as something separate from development or development separate from adaptation. And uh, we believe in this way that we'll really build a resilient society going into the future by trying to integrate these two things in a much more focused way. The other important thing that the long-term adaptation scenarios process does is to look cross-sectorally at solutions. So instead of just looking at solutions, say, in the water sector, to look also at how solutions in the water sector might benefit the agriculture sector, the human settlement sector, uh, and thus look for synergies between adaptation strategies across sectors and gain efficiencies that way. Within government, action is being initiated at national, provincial and local levels. In South Africa, National Government has adopted the National Climate Change White Paper and the National Development Plan, which set out key priorities and give direction for achieving these goals. Efforts are underway to access money from the International Adaptation Fund to support projects that make communities better able to deal with changing climate conditions. Some provincial governments are working to mainstream climate change considerations into their strategies and operations, as well as supporting municipalities to undertake climate change assessments and incorporate this into their local development plans. Most municipalities, however, still largely caught up with traditional service delivery agendas, now face the challenge of innovative change in an unpredictable future. There are efforts to focus local government spending on climate change considerations, especially in municipalities heavily affected by extreme events like large storms, flooding or severe water shortages. But coordination between departments, narrow performance management systems and financing constraints remain key stumbling blocks. We have got the National Development Plan that has been developed right now. That is a vision for how the country um, envisaged to see the different um, development ambitions. Um, climate change is a factor um, on its own. It does have got impact on that um, vision. And in terms of distribution of resources, water as a key resource for that matter, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important issue for development. Looking at what is province's role, to, to mainstream climate change into our own organisation, so into provincial government, 
uh, to support the municipalities, and that's the district and the local municipalities to do, to do the same, to mainstream um, and implement the National Climate Change Response Policy, to do information research and decision support to support not only our own organisation, but the districts and the municipalities as well, to interface between the national and the local, to sort of seek ways to find um, evidence of, of how things are changing at the local level and make sure that that gets all the way through into some kind of cohesive and comprehensive M&E framework at the national level. Within the business community, especially mining, energy and agriculture, companies are looking for new ways to manage climate risks and guard against critical shortages and damages that affect their operations. Examples being water restrictions and storm damage to transmission lines. And it's also important for business to understand how it impacts their day-to-day -day operations, their uh, supply chains, their ability to um, be sustainable in terms of keeping operating going into the future. The key thing is for the, for the engineers and the designers of either new facilities or um, rehabilitating um, and uh, putting in new, new kits is to understand how the baseline is going to change. Within civil society, NGOs and community groups are working together to share knowledge on long-term weather patterns as a basis for modifying local structures and practices. There are also unions and federations mobilising people to campaign for social and environmental justice, pushing for economic reforms and the creation of jobs that contribute to climate change risk reduction. We decided that our entry point would not actually be energy, water and food, but it would be community building. If you have a strong community, they can deal with anything. So things are happening, but not everywhere and not enough. People are still largely reporting on small projects, front runners, the early innovators, and not on the norm or the majority. Many people are reporting on the difficulties and frustrations associated with doing this work, but also on the useful lessons being learned that can make it easier for others to make a start. Lots of new information is being generated that relates to adapting to climate change across a range of specialisms. To avoid drowning in all this information, we need to work together across disciplines and organisations more effectively. But essentially what our community said, or the people feeding back to us said is, we want you to invest in projects that build on existing partnerships, that are multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, that are embedded in existing programmes of work that are cost effective and sustainable, and that very importantly produce concrete and tangible results that people can see in the kinds of communities that politicians are interested in seeing results happen in. The next step is to connect these existing activities in ways that create positive spin-offs, accelerate progress and magnify the benefits. So what does this entail? Well, it's about building support and learning networks that can accommodate competing priorities and disruptions. It's about using art, not just science, to engage people with concerns of climate change. It's about talking the many languages that people speak, whether it's about KPIs or clean audits in municipalities, risk profiling and investment opportunities in different companies, or land rights in certain communities. Most of the work that we've done so much is still based within the research world and the police world. What is still missing is us now connecting with people on the ground. And there are different vehicles or platforms that we can be able to utilize, such as the Working for Programs, which are already there. Um, however, we just need to mainstream the climate change adaptation concept within that work and we can be able to meet the other needs and also um, meet the other targets that we can be able to provide at that local level. There are also other opportunities that we can um, tap into through the NGOs or the community-based organizations. These are very critical in terms of communicating or tapping, knowledge about the, tapping into indigenous knowledge that is available within different communities. To show effectively the research results we're coming up with, in my experience is to not start with research results. 
In fact, when I engage with an outside community nowadays, the modality is to start off and saying, what is their context? What are they facing? What are decisions that they're going to be making irrespective of climate change? What are their thresholds that they need to worry about and concern themselves about, especially on the one decade time frame? And once we get an understanding about that, we can look at if there is an intersection between their vulnerabilities and the climate information. I think one of the things we have to do as scientists is uh, keep the politicians honest. But I think the second thing is for scientists is to try and understand the realities of the environment that politicians work within. And we're very poor at understanding the sort of dynamics and modalities of situations on a daily basis that they have to face up to. We should be concentrating on um, the solutions and the decisions rather than being so problem oriented. We need to be focused in our uh, discussion with people, uh, with decision makers on the decisions they're taking today or at least in the near future. We often come up with these wonderful solutions and these multi-sector, multi-stakeholder, you know, frameworks and implementation plans and so on. And we often forget to check if it's implementable. You should be able to adjust the, your offering uh, when you start talking solutions in a way that, you know, allows for those peaks and um, you know, down swings that municipalities do experience. Finding ways within the community of practice to share information and being able to share it in a way that, that people can truly understand I think is a, is a key goal. Um, we would like to see climate change not only being housed within a small unit within the broader organisation but we would like to start seeing climate change being or having a unit within all other spheres of government so that climate change at the end of the day is not seen as an environmental issue but seen as a cross-cutting issue. The most effective way i found for sharing my results with people outside of the research community is through art and artists. Um, a few years ago we started collaborating with artists because the research that we have really is like at, aimed at people's heads, at, at cognition, at understanding, and, and art really gets to people's hearts. Uh, we're t really trying to reframe this as, um, as a social and economic issue, not just an um, environmental one. Connecting um, sectors, connecting ideas, um, looking to answers in, in spaces that you don't normally look to. There are so many opportunities to actually become a whole lot more innovative in the space. Adaptation, it's about all of us. This is not all about government, this is not all about a certain NGO, it's not about a research institution, this is about how people they can be able to live within the system that is changing and it's unpredictable. It's bringing about different extreme events, bringing about extreme conditions, it's changing the socio-economic dynamics of our societies. What is evident from the first Southern African Adaptation Colloquium is that we have a growing community of people working on climate adaptation, especially in South Africa, with lots of research, policy development and planning ongoing. But big funding and investment in actions at all levels, international, national and local, is slow to materialise. Adaptation remains on the fringe. We need to strengthen working relationships and improve communication between science, civic associations, government and business. The plan is to make this Southern African Adaptation Colloquium an annual event, to keep building further on these conversations and networks as part of a growing community of practice. This will hopefully include more colleagues from elsewhere in the region to learn from, link up with and support what is happening in neighbouring countries and beyond.